I think I know just about everybody in the room. I'm glad to see you all here tonight because, you know, you kind of think, is anybody going to show up to know how to try to learn how to grow roses? Because some people just are so intimidated by it, which is just wrong. But anyway, but I'm glad you're all here and I hope I can share a little bit of information with you. For the first time ever, I'm using notes because I'm so old that I'm afraid I'll forget something and leave it out, you know. So I'm using a few notes. Anyway, um, I am a consulting rosarian with the American Rose Society. Uh, Which you do, means what? It means you go to school and you learn and you learn and you learn and you take a really hard test. It's a really hard test. And then you have to keep up your certification every four years. You go back and you retrain and then you can, um, and, and what that is is you are certified with the American Rose Society to teach um, just about anywhere um, that you want to and they encourage us to do that so that we can spread the love of roses. Um, and also, I'm a master gardener, so that's how I got into roses, I think. I, I'm not sure which came first, Ron. Maybe you remember. I don't know. Well, as, uh, as late as an hour ago, I was still um, making changes on this, so keep your fingers crossed that everything works okay. We're going to talk tonight about practical advice for growing fabulous roses, and I'm sure this is going to be very simple. Um, for many of you that already grow roses, it'll probably be repetitive, but just go with it. Um, you know, when I, when I do a presentation, wrong way, when I do, a, when I do a presentation sometimes, I'll, you know, you want to start with a funny story or a poem or something like that. And I had one that I've used for years on this presentation and I thought that's just so dorky. So this morning I went online, you know, and I was looking at some really interesting rose quotations and rose poems and that kind of thing. And they're just awful. They're just awful. But I mean, you know, it's all Shakespearean poems. And because Shakespeare, and he mentioned roses in 50 of his um, sonnets, poems, what, plays, whatever. So, um, and there's a lot of things out there that are just kind of boring. But here's a couple that I thought you might like. Uh, everybody knows who Ben Hogan is, right? Okay, well, here's what he said about roses. As you walk down the fairway of life, you must smell the roses for you only get to play one round. Um, here's another one. Uh, roses are red, violets are blue, I'm schizophrenic, and so am I. <laughs> and here's one that I really like. You'll, you'll recognize this, I'm sure. Roses are red, violets are purple, sugar is sweet, and so is maple syrple. That's from Roger Miller, if you remember him, he used to write songs. Okay, we're going to talk just a little bit about the amazing history of roses. I don't want to bore you with this, but I'm going to just give you some facts about roses and uh, maybe how they came to be. And um, I'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. Um, just a little bit of history is, you know, roses, they've been here like forever. Uh, there's a fossilized rose in Colorado that's 35 million years old. The first guide to roses was written in 300 BC by a student of Plato and Aristotle. Confucius, now this just amazes me, Confucius had a 600 book library on growing roses. I don't know how thick those books were, but if they were even that thick, what I know would not fill 600 books. In the 12th century, monks cultivated roses for medicinal purposes. Um, and then Champlain was the explorer that brought roses to North America in the 17th century. So we're going to talk about, um, that's, that's the history, okay? So we're going to talk about rose classifications. Now, I've got a magazine over here that breaks down the history of modern roses, and, and the family tree is, this is not, this is one beginning of the family tree. It goes on and on and on. And maybe even one more on. Yes, well, I think one more on. So we're not going to talk about that, but I have, it, it, there's so much knowledge out there and so many um, classifications of roses that I've broken it down into just four classifications. The reason I have done it like this is so that you can see the difference between those. And when, you know, when you're thinking about planting a rose in your garden, maybe instead of planting a hybrid tea, you might want to plant an old garden rose because they're really kind of neat. So I'm going to show you some pictures of those. And, and throughout this presentation, I've sprinkled in some different pictures of roses that I grow. So maybe if you like, like one of those, you might want to grow one. OK, the species roses, that's the very first one. That's the one from Genesis 1-1, you know, in the Bible. Uh, they came from uh, the very first. They had to come from somewhere. So I figure that's where they came from. It's also been reported that they were, there was a rose garden in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Um, and I think that the Garden of Eden Rose Garden, that would be something to see, don't you think? 
Okay, so those are the very first roses. They were the original ones, the wild ones. Um, then the next classification are the old garden roses, and we call that uh, the OGRs, just because it's easy to say, the OGRs. They're a major, the major class of roses that were recognized before 1867. It includes a whole group of roses like uh, the damask roses, the bourbon roses, Lady Banks is in that group, um, and also one I'm going to show you is the Souvenir de la Malmaison, and I'll tell you about that in a second. This was the OGRs, the predecessors of the modern roses as we know them. They bloom usually more than once. They have a nice light fragrance. They're fairly disease resistant, and many, are many were hybrid hybridized and were shipped from China and packed in boxes with tea shipped to England, and we think that maybe the, the, the name tea roses came from that very thing, that they were packed in boxes with tea leaves. Either that or the fact that there was a huge, huge rose uh, growing and hybridization nursery in southeastern China that was called Fa Tea, T-E-E. -E. So, you know, pick whichever one you want. Um, then the modern roses, these are any roses that are identified after 1867. The first hybrid tea was a rose called La France. Um, the modern roses include things like our fairy roses, the little fairy roses, or sometimes they're also in the classification of Pollyannas, um, the Grandifloras, the Floribundas, and of course, as I mentioned, the hybrid teas. Okay, then we come to the earth kind roses. This includes the newest ones that, we, that we're seeing planted so much, the knockouts. Uh, New Dawn is actually in that group. Um, this, the, these roses were developed at Texas A&M a few years ago, and what they did was they took 117 different varieties of roses and they planted them all out in the hot Texas sun. They watered them and fertilized them the first year. Um, they really didn't give them any other care than that. And so their, their objective was to find a rose that was fairly disease resistant, would still bloom in that hot Texas sun, and survive. So at the end of the study, um, they found 11 of those roses had survived, after, and the, the study lasted three years. They also, uh, none of those roses were impervious to black spot, but they did have a resistance to it, and they were tolerant. They also dropped less than 25 percent of their leaves during the growing period, and they didn't have much, not many problems with insects. Some of them had a few issues with aphids, but they were usually eradicated by some other insect, so not really a big deal. But those are the earth kind roses, and we will be talking about that that in just a few minutes, a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to show you some examples of some of the OGRs, the old garden roses. This is one Zephyrine Druine, and it can be either a climbing rose or it can be used as a shrub rose with that beautiful fountain type shape. It's really a pretty rose. It also will bloom a little bit better, uh, not a little better, but it will bloom somewhat in shaded areas so it doesn't have to have all the sun that a lot of the other roses do have. This is the Souvenir uh, de la Malmaison Rose. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but um, I saw this rose in France last year, and that's why I got excited about it, because uh, this, this was the rose that Josephine, you know of Napoleon and Josephine? She had um, someone hybridize this when she lived, uh, she and Napoleon lived in this chateau there that was called Malmaison. And so um, this was her rose. She had quite extensive gardens. I'm not saying that she actually dug in the dirt, probably not. But anyway, uh, she did have someone to hybridize this and to make lots of plants and things uh, there for their 150 acre estate. I also understand that while Napoleon was off getting beat up at Waterloo, that she was redoing the whole thing, you know, the whole chateau, and he was pretty upset about that. Anyway, okay, just a little trivia. Oh, and that rose also, I forgot to mention, that's why I have these notes. Um, it was also, it's also a bourbon rose. This is a Lady Banks rose that is in my yard. It is just the most magnificent rose ever, and you don't have to do absolutely anything to it. It's a climbing rose, as you can tell. I just let it cover that fence. And it also, there's a white variety besides the yellow. Now, these, I wanna show you these blooms up close and personal because they're small but you can see they're double and triple petaled blooms. It also doesn't have any thorns, which is really great. And you don't have to do much work to that. There's an interesting story behind the um, uh, Lady Banks rose. 
uh, it came from China originally in 1824. It was brought to Europe then. And then there was a couple that lived in England where this rose was, and they moved to, of all places, Tombstone, Arizona. So after a couple of years of living in the lovely desert of Tombstone, Arizona, this, the wife of the couple begged somebody to please bring her a cutting of a Lady Banks rose. So they did, and they brought that to her in 1884. That rose is still there. It, not only is it still there, but it is considered to be the largest rose in the world. It is on an arbor, supported by an arbor, that is 8,660 square feet. So your next trip to Tombstone, be sure and stop by there and see that Lady Banks rose, because it's, I'm sure it's something uh, quite unbelievable. Okay. Oh, this is a new dawn. This is an, this is one of our modern roses. Um, every, anybody have new dawn roses in here? And they're so beautiful. If you're familiar with the Mount Holly Cemetery in Little Rock, it's an old cemetery there on 630. In the early spring, if you're going west on 630, look over about Broadway and 9th Street. There's a huge fence that surrounds this cemetery, and it's completely covered with new dawn roses. Absolutely magnificent. It's very easy to uh, propagate that too, just from a cutting. It's also a repeat bloomer. This is a close-up of the, the, um, the bloom. Isn't that pretty? They're just about this big, but they're just absolutely beautiful. This is an example of an OGR and a modern rose. This is a David Austin rose. I've got a book up here about some of the David Austin roses. And this is a man from England, and he decided that he would like to combine the modern roses, the characteristics of the modern rose, with the OGRs, because the OGRs have such magnificent fragrance, and many of our hybridized roses do not. So he has a whole bunch of these that he has hybridized, and they're absolutely magnificent. This one is one called golden celebration. They, make, they grow into large shrubs. You also can possibly train them into um, climbers because they have that pretty weeping fountain-like shape. This is one called Abraham Darby. That's also a David Austin rose. All kinds of colors. He has a beautiful one called Pat Austin. Isn't that beautiful? And it's a salmon color. These roses, they have their, you can see how many petals that they have. They're not very dense. If you were to look at the bloom from the side, it's only about this thick. They're cupped kind of like this with all the, the beautiful petals in there. They're wonderful to cut and take in your house because the fragrance is so magnificent. The thing is, you want to do it right before they open completely because they will shatter pretty easily. Um, and then that'll give you a little bit more time to enjoy that fragrance. Okay, now we're going to look at uh, one of the earth kind roses. This is the uh, a rainbow knockout, the single petaled one. And then this is a double red knockout. Um, don't look at those weeds. <laughs> okay. And then next we have a grandiflora. Isn't that pretty? That one is, that variety is called Rio Samba. It's pretty common. It's real pretty. And then this one is, a, is called a Floribunda. Now, a Grandiflora is a cross between a hybrid tea and a Floribunda. The Floribunda roses, when, when they bloom, you can see right there, when they all bloom, you can have just a bouquet from one stem. Your Grandifloras will be a little bit more like the hybrid teas with the pointed blooms, the big fancy uh, buds, and the thick stems, but a little bit more clustered um, than the regular hybrid tea roses. Okay, Americans have always loved roses. In fact, we love it so much that we've made it our national em floral emblem. George Washington, I don't know how those sound effects got in there, and I don't know how to take them out either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, George Washington, as we know, was the, was the father of our country. He was also the first rose breeder. Thomas Jefferson was also at his uh, home in Monticello. He also grew lots of roses there, for, not only for the beauty, but for medicinal purposes as well. This is a picture of the White House Rose Garden that was first planted by Mrs. Woodrow Wilson in 1913. It was redesigned in 1935 and in 1961, I believe, yes, by the Kennedy administration. In 1986, where is Ronald Reagan when we need him, right? <laughs> President, in 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed into law the rose as the national uh, floral emblem of the United States. 
and here is Ronald Reagan's rose. Isn't that beautiful? That's a hybrid tea rose, and you can see from the form of that, um, it has that pointed spiral center, and that's what you look for when you're looking for a hybrid tea rose, a really good one. It's beautiful, that dark red with the white reverse, and the, the glossy green leaves, which are hard to see from that picture, but that is a Ronald Reagan. Okay, before you start, there are some things you need to know, and you probably already know this. First thing you want to do is get you a really great pair of gloves. These are, the, these are the ones I use. I get these from a place called Lee Valley, which you're probably all familiar with. And the best thing about them is, you know, you don't get any puncture wounds in your arms. They're nice and thick. They're also washable. So I just throw them in the washing machine every once in a while, and I really do like these. Uh, they're a little bit pricey, but, you know, they last forever if you take good care of them. So, you know, just go ahead and do it. Then the next thing you, you want to have is a good pair of bypass pruners. Um, the picture there shows Felco pruners. That's what I like, F-E-L-C-O, Felco pruners. You can get these from several mail, mail order companies. Uh, Lee Valley will also carry those. I have a pair here. This is the Felco 6 size. It's for left hands. I'm left-handed. My husband bought me this, but I don't use those with my left hand. I prune with my right hand. So anyway, uh, it's okay. It works still anyway. But my favorite pair are somewhere, I think, under mulch in my yard because I was using them last and I cannot find them. Anyway, but these are great uh, pruners. This is a size 9. And uh, they're the only different, the difference between the sizes, of course, is the size of the blade. The good thing about these is they are so, they last so long and are such good pruners that if they become dull or your blade gets chipped, all you have to do is buy a new set of blades and just screw them in there. And you can even take them up to, um, uh, not Cantrell Gardens, but Good Earth Garden Center in Little Rock. They sell the blades, and if you buy them from them, they'll put them on for you. So get you a good pair of pruners. Keep them nice and sharp, and keep them clean. That makes a, a big difference. And when you're pruning, I like to use those little um, wipe things, you know, those little Lysol wipe things between bushes. It helps to keep disease from spreading. Okay, and then the last thing, whether you grow roses or not, just as a gardener, you need to get a tetanus shot. Tetanus, that bacteria, as I understand it, lives in the dirt, and we are always in the dirt, aren't we? <clears throat> so, um, and they particularly, that bacteria particularly likes puncture wounds, which you can get easily from a rose bush. So uh, every five to 10 years, you need to have your tetanus shot renewed and be sure you get one because it's very important. Okay, the next, pic next thing is you wanna have your site preparation and, and do a, a really great site. This was my very first rose bed. And um, my husband built that. It was really pretty simple, just some boards, and I kind of lined the inside with some heavy fabric that would let the water drain out. Um, but the main thing you want to remember about the site prep is you need six to eight hours of sun per day. Um, a few, week, a few years ago, I was helping my friend Bobby and Susie Cox at their garden center, and this lady came, brought a rose bush up to the counter to pay for, and uh, so she was asking me a few questions, and she said, well now, do you think it'll be okay if I plant this in a place that just gets a couple of hours of sun a day because I, I have mostly shade? And I said, no ma'am, you really need six to eight hours of sun a day. Now, they won't die probably, but you won't get any blooms, and isn't that why we grow roses? So anyway, she bought it, <laughs> and I never heard what happened, but you know, I guess that was her rose experiment, so I was just happy for her. Anyway, but you do need six to eight hours of sun a day uh, for your roses. Uh, the next thing is your soil. You want to, uh, for your soil, it's really great to have a combination of compost, sand, sandy loam. Roses love, love, love water, but they don't like to sit in it. So you need to have good soil that will drain. No clay, but something that will drain as when, they're, when they are watered. Um, also, your, your soil, you need to have it with a pH, which is parts of hydrogen, I believe. Uh, that's what that stands for. Doesn't really mean anything to me, but anyway. Uh, 6.0 to 6.5, that's a, an acidic soil, very acidic soil. Um, on your um, scale of soil pH, seven is neutral with going down is acid, going up is alkaline. So you want it between 6 and 6.5. You can buy those little things that you stick in the dirt 
to see what your, your uh, soil pH is. Or you can take a sample to Ron Matlock at the County Extension Office and he'll get back this report that you cannot figure out, but he can. So you just let him explain that to you. Um, also, the, the importance of pH, we always talk about it, but really what does it do? Um, when your pH is right for a certain plant, it means that the roots of that plant can take in or uptake the minerals and vitamins and things that are in the soil that are good for them. Otherwise, you may just be worse, wasting your money and just throwing things away. Um, also, a good thing to add to your soil is worm castings. I love worm castings. They're so great. Anybody here use worm castings? Aren't they fabulous? You can get them from Ed Griffin out in Haskell. And uh, he's always re either, ha either having a sale or they're uh, reasonably priced, but worm castings are good. Then the last thing is good drainage. That's a drain in case you didn't know what that was. Uh, but that's also the point of the raised bed. Two really good things about a raised bed is one, the drainage, and two, you don't have to bend over as far. Um, okay, that's kind of, I think, all on that that I need to tell you. Oh, no, there was one other thing, yeah, a couple of things. When you're buying your roses, be sure to check those and make sure that you're buying a number one grade rose bush. You know, there's a gazillion out there. Buy from reputable companies, reputable places. You can buy them online. You can buy them here in town from Cox's. You can buy them from Cantrell Gardens. Usually has a very good um, a variety of roses. But you can go online and you can buy from places like Edmund Roses, Weeks Roses, Jackson and Perkins. And on your um, your handout there, I think on the back I put a couple other places that I like to buy from. One is in a, a great place called Buckatuna, Mississippi. Who I never heard of that before. Uh, but anyway, when you buy those, make sure you get good roses. And I'm not saying that those that are in the plastic bags coated in wax are terrible because I bought those a long time ago and I've still actually got one that's alive. Um, but they're just, sometimes they're just not the best quality and sometimes that wax, as hot as it gets in our climate, can have a tendency to hurt those canes on the roses. So just stay with um, a good reputable source. Uh, if you are ordering those and you, you can order them um, you know, in a pot and you can set those out. You can plant those in your garden just about any time of year when they're in the pot. Um, if you order them bare root, does everybody know what I mean when I'm saying bare root? Um, as soon as you get those in and they're bare root, that means if you don't know what it is, it means that they're just you just have the plant and the root and they're usually wrapped in plastic usually there's something there's a little bit of moisture in there hopefully by the time you get it because they try to ship them pretty quickly so you can get them in before the, the roots dry out first thing you want to do is take those out and put them in a bucket of water kind of warm tepid not really hot water warm water and then pour about a cup of bleach in there that will help kill any anything that might possibly be going on there then you want to look at those roots really good and if they look like some of them might be a little dead or broken or something just trim those off then when you get ready to plant those you will plant those um, so that wh what you do is you'll dig your hole you'll make a little mound of dirt and then you spread those roots out over that. Now, on a hybrid tea rose, you will have a bud union. And bud unions in our climate need to stay a little bit above the soil. In some climates, like in the north, they will cover them up just to protect them. The bud union is where the, the two plants were joined, were grafted together. So you want to protect that. Um, and you can just, just fill, backfill that once you get your, your roots spread out, backfill that hole, and, um, and then just keep that uh, bud union above that slightly. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. All right. This is a part of one of my first rose beds, just so you can see it up close. Um, that rose is, I'm not sure what that red one is, the one behind it, the second one is Black Magic. And I've got one of those here tonight, and then Bell Aroma is that third one. You can see pine, pine needles are perfect for mulch. Here's another view of one of those. Henry Fonda's on the left, and that is Fragrant Cloud on the right, which is one of my very favorite favorites. It smells wonderful, and it has this beautiful deep salmon color. Okay, three essential elements for fabulous roses. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is make sure they're getting plenty of water. During the summer months, they need to get about two inches per week. 
And so that means a lot of watering because we haven't had a lot of rain recently, especially. That picture, if you can't tell what that is, is a soaker hose. I use those in my beds. They work very well. And I water usually like twice a week. The first time, usually, I'll, I'll water with the soaker hose. The second time, I'll water by hand because when you water those by hand, you can get up close and personal with those bushes and you can see what's going on with them, if there's any disease, if there's any insect, anything going on that you need to take care of. But about two inches a week. Then the next thing you want to uh, look at, of course, is fertilizing. Good things to use for fertilizer, organics are great. Things like blood meal, uh, bone meal, fish emulsion, alfalfa. There's a product called Mills Magic Mix uh, that you can buy. Nitron also has a, a, a rose mix that's really great. A lot of people use Epsom salts and that's magnesium sulfate. You can just throw, put about a cup around the drip line of the plant, scratch it into the soil, and then just water it in. That helps the plant a lot. I've never used it, but I know a lot of people do. Uh, the one I have pictured there is uh, the Rose and Flower Care by Bayer. I use that uh, fairly frequently. This one is the three-in-one, the systemic. Um, that's the granules. There's also a liquid that you can mix with water and pour it around the drip line of the plant. Um, I use the three-in-one because it is insecticide, fungicide, as well as a fertilizer. Um, but you want to, the thing you want to remember about those kind of products is that you need to uh, alternate with something. Otherwise, the rose will build up a resistance. This is a great product, Mancozeb or Manzate for black spot. Uh, you can get it at Farmer's Co-op. It's about $20 for this size of bottle. And then this is another one, a Fertilone Triple Action. It also works a lot for um, insects and things. When you've, you want to start spraying for your uh, black spot and uh, fun, fungus and things like that, as soon as you do your spring pruning, you really don't want to start spraying with an insecticide or anything like that until you see something. Because you don't want to just randomly go out there and spray everything without, because it might not work for whatever you may have. So, um, okay, and then the third thing, I kind of uh, already said that, is um, the um, spraying, spraying, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, as I said, you want to begin your, your spraying with your fungicide as soon as you um, prune that in the spring, every seven to 10 days, you want to keep that up. Um, don't stress out if you have black spot. You live in Arkansas, we have humidity of 900%, you're going to have black spot. Just get over it and spray. There's nothing else you can do. Uh, as far as insects, well, and actually for your fungus, funguses and things too, you want to identify what you have before you just start randomly spraying for things. So that's where Ron comes in again. He will send that off to Lone Oak to the, the place over there that and Sherry will diagnose what kind of insect you have if you can't figure it out on your own. Um, or, you know, call me, I'll come and look, Ron will come and look, you know, we'll be happy to help you with that. Uh, another product I wanted to mention to you uh, for Black Spot is one called Banner Max. If you go to, um, well, go to a website called rosemania.com and they have everything you've ever wanted to know about or buy for roses. It's all there. You can buy Banner Max from there. Try to find a friend, though, that needs it too because it's pretty expensive and if you can split the cost, it would, it's, it's a lot better. Then also things like the Mancozeb or Manzate that I mentioned and then Ortho and Fertilone, those are also good products. One thing you want to remember, and I said a minute ago, you know, about, um, um, alternating the products. Don't just alternate the brands. Look on the label and see what the active ingredient is because some of them may have the same in active ingredient and even though you are alternating Manzite and Bayer or Manzite and Fertilone, if that active ingredient is the same, you're not doing yourself any good. So read those labels and make sure it's different before you, you start to buy it and then that'll, that will help a lot so that they won't get um, immune to that. Okay. Oh, that's Pass. yes. So when do you fertilize? Or are you gonna cover that later? And how, and how much? I just do it. Oh, I don't know. When I feel like it, <laughs> yes, I kind of do. Well, especially if you're gonna show a rose at a rose show, you really want to fertilize a lot thin. Um, but you know. Actually, I do have a sort of a program. When I was telling you a minute ago about the alfalfa meal, the blood meal, the, all that, I mix that together. I do a cup of each. I mix it in a, a big uh, bucket. 
and then that makes like a, a pretty good size. I add that, that whole thing around one rose bush twice a year. I do it in May and then I do it again in July. And you just scratch it into the soil and it's really good organics. Let me, let me repeat that again. It's out, um, uh, blood meal, bone meal, fish emulsion, and that smells so nice. I remember Lois, Bob told me a story one time about he was putting fish emulsion, I think, in some roses of his, and he was just out there working up a storm, and all of a sudden he looked back behind him, and I think his dog was digging up all the rose bushes because <laughs> it smells so great. <laughs> um, also alfalfa pellets or alfalfa meal. You, those are the things that I mix together and sort of make my little meals, as I call them, one in the first of the spring and then one again in July, and that really pretty much gets you through the whole season, but you can still um, add some super bloom if you're planning to enter a rose competition um, later. Okay, these are just some of my roses, so you can see what they look like um, at one point. Ah, rose pests and diseases, here we go. This is always exciting. First thing that you do, as I mentioned a while ago, is you wanna diagnose what you have. This is not by any means all the things that you can have, aphids, um, you can take care of a bunch of aphids just with a blast of water, but you have to do it every day because they're so prolific that they just love it and they come right back. Leaf cutter bees, I really wouldn't worry about, but when you see those little half moons out of your leaf, that's what it is, and they're just building their nest. That usually just happens maybe once a year or something. Japanese beetles, we, thank goodness, have not, don't really have those here yet. They're kind of more in the northern climates, but they're terrible, I understand, once they finally do arrive in your area. And then any kind of blight. Any of these things you can give to Ron, and he'll send those to the wherever they need to go to get diagnosed. Now, we do have cucumber beetles. Everybody know what cucumber beetles are? They're green ladybugs is what they look like. Um, my roses, they really seem to like my roses quite a bit. Okay, and then let's see. Oh yeah, these are some of the fungus things. Uh, and, and this is, you can really see how some of these are similar. So you really wanna make sure you're diagnosing the right thing. The anthracnose is up there at the top. Black spot is the one that most of us have. Downy mildew, you can tell a little bit of difference because that black part, once it's on one side of the leaf, it really doesn't cross that center line where the others will. And then powdery mildew, that's just part of life in Arkansas. So uh, there's some there's some really good things. That Bayer that I showed you will take care of a lot of those. Mancozite is great. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about that too. You spray that, um, put it in your sprayer and spray it out, mix it with water. And one little tip that I, I use, when I buy this, I figure out what I'm supposed, the dose I'm supposed to use, and I write it on the side because you know these little paper things, they just are awful, and in a few weeks they'll be gone anyway. So I do that on the side and it just saves me a lot of stress on down the line. Um, Oh yes, the mancozite. Uh, when you mix that with water and you spray it on your, your leaves, it's gonna leave a little bit of a yellow film and it's really not easy to rub off. So if you're entering a rose show, you wanna stop using that about a month ahead of the show. Um, otherwise, just let it go because it really is not that distracting and it really, it really will, this is probably the best product to control black spot. Spray on the top and the bottom? I spray everything. I spray the soil. Mm -hmm. Top, bottom, side, blooms, soil. I spray it all. Um, you know, just in case. You never know. Okay, this is the newest thing, although it's not new. We're just hearing about it a lot now. Rose rosette disease. Um, this is what... Uh, what the common name comes from the way this looks right here, it's called witch's broom. And it's the, probably the most dreaded disease for rosarians, they just gasp when you mention rose rosette disease. But you can tell the, how uh, the canes look, they have a profuse amount of, of thorns there, a lot of red foliage. Now you will have red foliage anyway when, it, when a plant starts to grow and put on new things, but this, it's excessive and you'll be able to tell. You, you just know it when you see it. And then this, of course, there's no mistaking that for rose rosette disease. There's some reasons for that. This has been around forever and ever and ever. We're seeing more of it now simply because of the no care roses. Everybody's buying more of them, of course, because they're easy and, and they don't have to spend a lot of time with them. So they buy a bunch and they plant them. And then there comes along this little tiny microscopic mite that, has in, that is infected with the fungus. 
And what happens is it gets on that leaf and then it starts to eat and then it infects the plant. Then it will stand up on the leaf. It's the funniest looking little thing. It stands up on the leaf and it waits for the wind to blow it to the next plant. And then it eats that plant and then it goes on and on and on forever. So the thinking now is to plant not in mass, but to plant a rose, a, a rose bush and then plant something like that would be bigger, that could break that cycle of the wind blowing. Don't ask me what. They've suggested pampas grass, which sounds ugly to me, but whatever. Um, but that's, that's kind of the preventative right now. Um, <clears throat> down at Owens Mooney Park, a lot of you know that that was my, my project down there. And about eight years ago, we planted 26 knockout roses, 13 on each side of the fountain. And they looked so beautiful until about three years ago. And I noticed rose rosette. Well, at the time, I didn't, uh, the, first of all, the, the thing you need to do if you have it is to pull those out, burn them, bag them, whatever. And don't ever plant a rose again there because this only affects roses. It doesn't affect any other plant. But if you, it's in the soil and if you plant a rose bag, it will surely have it. Anyway, so um, back to Owens Mooney. Oh yeah, um, I didn't pull them up right away because at the time, University of Texas was doing this big study and they said, oh, we think we're gonna have a cure or control before very long. So I left them there for another couple of roses, uh, roses another couple of years, and then it seemed that there was not going to be a cure. And this like, past spring, I went to a, uh, American Rose Society meeting in Tulsa and they said pull them up get them out there's not a cure now and it's going to be a while however there is a government grant that uh, so that uh, Oklahoma State University University of Tennessee and the University of North Carolina I believe are the three schools that are working together to come up with a cure or control before too long so hopefully we'll find something that will take care of that before long but but you do have to pull it up because it, there's no cure and it will infect your other roses. Um, okay. Oh, the, pr the P word. Pruning. We all, you know, sometimes I think that rosarians are just, I don't, I, well, I think that they like to make growing roses sound really, really hard. And they m like to make the pruning part just scary. And it's really not. It's just so easy once you learn it. And, you, you know, it, People shy away from roses because they think there's a lot of work involved. There is a little bit more work involved, but gosh, the payoffs are so great. Can you think of another perennial that would bloom from May through November? You know, I, I really can't. And with all those magnificent blooms and colors and things, to me it's worth it just to put a little bit more effort into it. And not all of them, as I mentioned, require all the work that a hybrid tea does. Those old garden roses and the David Austin roses, those are so easy, you just put them out there and they are happy. Okay, pruning, the P word. Oh, there's, this is a lover's lane at the front and that's a John F. Kennedy behind that. White roses are really hard to grow in our climate because of thrips. They get in there and they, the, they turn the edges of your white roses brown. Okay, pruning cuts. We're gonna talk about this for just a minute. Back with your good pruners, you wanna make sure they're nice and sharp. You can see here, this is too high. What, what, when, you wanna, when you prune, you'll, you'll do your spring pruning and then you do deadheading all throughout the year. And then you'll also do something in the winter uh, to winterize your plant that I'll talk about in just a minute. But this is for pretty much uh, your spring pruning as well as when you're deadheading. You want to look for that bud eye on the cane of the rose and you want to make a cut that's 40, about 45 degrees. You know, just ballpark it. Um, I've heard some people say, oh, that doesn't matter, just cut it straight across. Well, maybe. Um, but <clears throat> I do know that we have this thing called gravity. And if a drop of water gets on the flat top of a rose cane, it can seep into that and can cause dieback. And then you've got another problem. So I would just do it at a 45 degree angle to start out with, then it rolls right off and it's not a problem. You see, that one is a little too high. You wanna do it just about a quarter inch above that bud eye. And the bud eye, when, you, when I say that, when you are deadheading, say for example, your rose, is this one is up here, your bloom is here, and you wanna take that off and cut that. But you want, what you want to do is you wanna look for a, a leaflet 
This is a leaflet, a leaflet of five leaves. You'll go down that cane until you look right inside there and you'll see between that and the cane, you'll see a little tiny something that's kind of sticking out, not really sticking out, but just a little bump there on the cane. That's a bud eye. That's where you can cut it at your 45 degree angle there so that your next rose will come out from there. Um, and I like to go down as far on the cane as I can to find one because when you cut this here, the next cane that comes out is going to be thinner. It's going to be a little bit not as, not as thick in diameter. So I go down as far as I can. Okay. Um, and we'll, we're going to prune that rose, I think, in a minute if we have time. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Any questions on the pruning cuts? It's not a big deal. It's easy. <coughs> This is a uh, lover's line. Yes, this is, this is all, no, this is, I think, Hot Princess. I don't know. I forget. This one I know for sure is Black Magic. The, look at the bud up there. You can see the bud up there in the corner. It looks black when it's just getting ready to start. And then it has that velvety look. It's so beautiful. And you can see when you, when you enter a rose contest, a rose show, they look for hybrid teas, they look for what they call a high, tight, spiral center. And you can see that in these. Now the old garden roses, you won't have that because that's a totally different thing. But that's what you will look for in the hybrid teas. Okay, this is called Tropical Sunset. Okay, during the winter you may experience some cane damage. So when you're starting to do your pruning in the spring, which is late February, early March, before your uh, uh, plants have broken dormancy um, and you're, you're cut, making those 45 degree angle cuts, you may run into something like this, those two on the right there, that is winter damage from those. So all you do is you just keep going down that cane a little bit at a time until you don't have that. And that, I believe, Lois, I think that's Veterans Honor. It looks like it, I believe. <laughs> Uh, Veterans Honor. I think that's what we have up at the courthouse in the, the Veterans Memorial up there. Yeah. And that bush gets very, very tall. Okay, we're going to talk just a second. Let me see what I got next. Oh, oh. Okay, we'll get back to that. Um, anyway, we want to talk about winterizing your roses, which is what you need to be doing now if you haven't already. Um, there's several schools of thought on this. On the David Austin roses, if you have those, you want to cut those down about halfway. Um, and then just leave them. Mulch, mulch them at the bottom, really good. Um, and then your, your uh, hybrid teas and uh, some of those uh, grandiflores and floribundas, I cut those, I cut mine down to about halfway. And a lot of people will say, oh, you shouldn't cut those more than a third. Well, the reason I do is because during the winter, you know, sometimes we have those, those storms and they rock those plants back and forth. And that can do damage to your root roots uh, underneath. It can break the roots. It can even break the plants off. So if they, don't, if they don't have as much plant to blow, then they won't rock back and forth as much. But, and you can also tie your canes together if you want to do that. But I cut mine off about halfway. In fact, I'll probably do that tomorrow. And then I use pine needles and I mulch those up about six to eight inches up around, around the bud union. You want to make sure that that's covered in the winter with the mulch because that's the most important part of the plant. Okay, let me see. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. Okay. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, this is either rock and roll or sentimental. I can't remember which, but it's one of those two, in case you like that. Uh, this is Double Delight. That's a beautiful, beautiful rose. And this, once again, that's fr Fragrant Cloud, and that's Henry Fonda over there on the right side. Okay, well, we're just about finished here. Um, let me just give you a little bit of information that I know you're going to want to know this. Um, at, the, at the Kentucky Derby, the Garland of Roses is made up of 500 rosebuds. And the, and the uh, people that are there in charge, they will pull out one of those rosebuds, dip it in silver, and then they give it to the owner of the horse. So one more example of how roses are used everywhere for everything. Roses are the favorite flower of 85% of Americans. And did you know that they have more vitamin C than any fruit or vegetable? Isn't that incredible? There are 16,000 varieties of roses now available for commerce every year, and 150 million rose plants are purchased worldwide every year. So, lots of people besides us like roses. So, um, 
that kind of covers everything. I've got some uh, materials up here if you'd be interested in seeing these. I've got a little brochure over here on David Austin roses if you'd like to see that. Um, these are from the American Rose Society. And let me tell you, um, if you're gonna grow roses, it's great to be a member of that. It costs one person about $50 a year. But let me tell you, this magazine comes out every two months and it is packed full of great information and it's really, really good. I highly recommend it. It's got history, it's got things probably you don't want to know, all kinds of chemical things that don't matter to me, but it has also really, really good things, practical things that you might be interested in. Um, also, as part of your membership, you get this every year. This is called Selecting Roses, and what this is, it's an alphabetical listing of all the roses that are out there, and it, it tells you on a scale of one to 10 whether they are good or whether they are not so good. And it's really great when you're picking out a rose bush. It's nice to know that. Um, there's just another book there. I have a little bitty uh, thing up here, a little, I, I didn't do this, I found this today. There are a few copies of this. Um, it's on fundamentals of pruning. To me it's confusing, but you know, if you'd like one, feel free to take it. Um, and this is, this is a book I wanted to show you. This is the, from the Chateau Malmaison in, in outside of Paris. And this is a picture of that rose that Josephine um, had developed. It's really kind of cool. Um, and then these are some roses from my garden today. And I just have to show you this one and brag a little bit because this one is Gemini, which is a really uh, well-known rose. And this is really, I could win a rose show with this. It's, it's big, it's um, got the perfect form for a spiral, the spiral and the round spiral in there. And you'll also see that here on this. And I believe this is, this is Veterans Honor too. You can see the spiral, it's a little bit off center. Um, this is Apertif, it's a yellow one. And then this is Black Magic, Hot Princess, and this is Bellaroma. So anyway, you're welcome to come and look at those. We're gonna give those away and we're gonna prune this. If you wanna stick around after we're finished, we'll prune that. Since we've already got a rose on, a bloom on that one, I'll just take this one out. That's kind of a, just a guesstimate on that, on what you would do. You can root it, it won't be probably this rose because this is a hybrid. Go ahead and take these completely out, those little ones. These will be gone because it's um, spring. Now I'm gonna cut this off, you want this rose? Okay, I'd cut this down to, actually see this is a, this is an old rose, you can tell because of uh, the way these look. Yes. Normally, yeah, yeah, normally in a, in a rose you're gonna have canes going every direction. But actually these are probably okay, except I would take this out right here. Uh, yeah, I would take this out because it's already got some disease. And then I would just probably just trim these down. This one I'd take out. It's too thin. Yeah. Uh, and then the others, I would just kind of cut them down, you know, to about 18 inches maybe. You want me to go ahead and cut it? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> now, why would you go across on these but the end of the spring? Well, I was doing that because I couldn't really see it. So I probably will go back. That's what I was going to say. I would make oh. your first cuts and then go back oh, and do your 45s at an angle. And like this one, you could take off maybe to about right here, just to get off some of that. Oh, you put the long piece this long you're talking about? That is, that would be a butt eye, yeah. Yeah, and, and these will be gone anyway, because this is, it's gonna be after winter. Yeah, yeah it is, they look, at, they look naked, and I would take this down to about that same height of that one. And there's not, yeah, there's a butt eye right there, so I would just kind of do a little bit like that. How do you know it's a bad? It just kind of a little bit of a protrusion oh, okay. there. What I was telling you about, about um, you were talking about um, a deadheading, mm -hmm. and when you cut those down, what like you look one. for, yes, like this one. Okay, here's one right here. Can everybody see? You'll go down your cane, look for the five leaflet, you know, and you can start, I like to start, you know, fairly far down so you can see. When you get too far down, you won't have any. Yeah. Um, here's one, you can tell it's just barely starting to form a bud eye right in there. There's usually a just little tiny bump there. Let me see if I can find a good one so y'all can see it. Yeah, here's one right here. See that, that little 
thing that's sticking out right there. You see, Paula? Yes. Okay. That's where you will make your next cut. It's on the leaf. It's not on the stem. No, it's actually on the stem. Is that right there? Is that what you're looking at? No, I'm looking at... See this thing right here? That's right there. No, it's that little tiny thing. It's got a little bitty brown thing on it right there, which means this is probably not going to be a good one because it's already brown. But um, I would go ahead if this is this is a summer deadheading, and then cut it just a little bit above it at a 45 degree angle. And there you go. That's it. And then your your next one. Your next one. This where this where your butt eye is. The next cane will come out from here. And it will be smaller than this. That's why I like to go down as far as I can to find one. That's the other problem is that I trim off at the first five leaf, and then I have a lot petted. Yeah, little little thin ones. But you're good to go. Thank you. You're welcome.